So thank you everybody for coming. I'm just grateful. I don't, I'm recording this partly because I want to share it, you know, on the channel, of course. I know there's several major board groups around town. I, I'm just pressed to get out a lot of material lately, so I'm just hoping you can catch it on the channel. So I'm just glad that there's some, some here that got it live because I will... I want to share the graces I've received, which are not personally spectacular, but I have a lot of insights I want to share. All right, so let's begin. Mezhigorji and the end times. Mezhigorji, that's the way Mickey, our tour guide, pronounced the name of his hometown. I entitled this and the end times because Mary says her visits to this village will bring to a conclusion her intervention to help us through this apocalyptic era. My personal pilgrimage to Mezhigorji began with my YouTube on the holy face of Jesus. I had spoken of the miracle in the Vatican that occurred before a large crowd the Christmas octave of 1848. The face on the old faded linen, venerated as Veronica's veil, came alive. This sensational event was regarded as a confirmation <laughs> of the revelations of the holy face that had been granted to a French Carmelite nun who had died in the odor of sanctity just a few months previous. Sister Saint Pierre, or Sister Saint Peter, had a brother who migrated to the United States in search of employment. One of his descendants, thus a great niece of Sister St. Peter, is presently living in the town of Atchison near Kansas City. Devotion to the Holy Face had been strong in her childhood, but in her efforts to hand it down to her teenagers, she was feeling called to write a new book for English readers, which would present more accurately the importance of these revelations for our times. Although she is well-educated, this busy mother of five had never published a book before and was feeling a need for encouragement to begin. From my website, she knew I was residing in Wichita. Her husband urged her to accompany him to a convention in Newton, a town near Wichita. The hotel was packed, so we ended up meeting in the newly restored, gorgeous old church of St. Mary, where we spoke of the Holy Face for several hours. Less than two weeks after that delightful encounter with the Holy Face Lady, I received a call from a man who ran a blog site promoting devotion to the Holy Face of Jesus. He had also discovered me on YouTube and wanted to fly from Wisconsin to Wichita to speak with me about this important devotion. I suggested that he fly instead to Kansas City. And we all met in Atchison. I had a new friend in Kansas City. During my internet research on the approved apparitions of Our Lady of America, I received valuable information from a woman named Pamela Jackson. She had experienced a healing through Mary at the apparition site in Rome City, Indiana. Pam said many times that if I ever came to Kansas City, I should stay at her home. When I explained my reason for traveling to Atchison, she asked to be included in the meeting since she too had a devotion to the Holy Face. And thus it happened. The couple from Wisconsin, the couple from Atchison with their five teenagers, Pam and myself sat in the drawing room under antique pictures of Sister St. Peter and her relatives. I apologize that I didn't take any pictures of this brief but life-bonding encounter. We all resolved to stay in touch trusting that the Lord would direct our separate efforts to promote reparation to his wounded face. Two weeks later, on Christmas morning, the day when the Mother of God held her divine child for the first time, Len was in prayer and felt strongly that Mary was calling him to return to Mezhigorji. Len had been once before on the 100th anniversary of Fatima, and now he was supposed to invite as many of his friends and family as possible. That very day at Mezhigorji, Mary gave a message that echoed what Len felt in prayer. December 25th, 2018. Dear children, I am carrying to you my son Jesus, who is the King of Peace. He gives you peace, and may it not be only for you, but to carry it to others in joy and humility. If you ever meet Len, he's at your service in joy and humility. I had never even dreamed of going to Mezhigorji. I followed Mezhigorji from the beginning in 1981 when still a Carmelite novice. 
Word trickled into the cloister that six teenagers in faraway Yugoslavia were seeing the Blessed Mother every day. I wasn't much older than the children. I'm usually very cautious about not yet approved apparitions, but it was just too much for these teenagers to invent. Moreover, they endured draconian persecution from the communists and little enthusiasm from their fearful bishop, who was probably intimidated or threatened by the communists. My family sent me the popular book by Wayne Weibel, a Lutheran who investigated the apparition as a curiosity for his small newspaper. He ended up going to the village numerous times and becoming a Catholic. No one can calculate how many people were inspired by Wayne's book to travel to Mejigorje and see for themselves what was happening. The number of pilgrims descending on this poor village became astronomical, and soon a lay apostolate developed to televise events live from Mejigorje. Mary TV remains on location and is a highly appreciated and very respected website. Another group of lay apostles felt called to print the messages and disseminate Mary's messages as cheaply as possible. Soon they took advantage of the internet as another tool to spread the word. Look at their printing operation. I went there myself to see it and live with these families for a time. Caritas of Birmingham is located 20 miles southeast of Birmingham, Alabama, in gorgeous country. It's the largest Mejigorji center in the world, promoting the events in all sorts of venues. They run pilgrimages and have a center in Mejigorji itself. You don't even have to buy books. You can read the messages online or download them free. They've developed software to facilitate word searches and date searches. This is a huge service because Mary has been giving messages since 1981. That's nearly 40 years. You do the math. Radio Wave, I like to listen to. It's a Caritas weekly program. They talk about the challenges of living a moral life today and how to bring the United States back to its Christian roots. Their mission is to promote the enculturization of Mary's messages into everyday life. Naturally, these excellent Catholics have attracted the anger of Satan, and the old serpent has employed every minion he can find to calumniate them and shut them down. Please do not believe the false news that you find on the internet maligning this community. They are not a cult. I investigated them carefully. I've seen some dysfunctional religious communities, so I knew what to look for. Nobody was there by compulsion. Families had their own houses, well separated. The children were happy and well-adjusted, clearly blessed to grow up in that wholesome milieu. They play and work outdoors in a ranch environment and then come in to watch their parents run high-tech equipment. It's like a little village with its own little school. It's truly idyllic. If every town in the USA could imitate this lifestyle, it would be the end of a culture dominated by drugs and suicides and broken families. The third website I want to recommend is Entering the Mystery. It's a blog operated by a Wichita woman and has several thousand email and Facebook followers. Sign up and devotional thoughts and beautiful images will be sent straight to your inbox. Janet is artistic and has a degree in theology. She connects Mary's messages to the day's feast or some current event and she often supplies helpful links. Back in the heyday of Mejigorje, there was a Mer Center in Wichita and many cities all over the USA. That generation has aged in 40 years, and every new thing tends to lose momentum. But Mejigorje is making a big comeback right now because Mary keeps telling us that this is her time. A very exciting development happened recently. The official Vatican investigation offered the Holy Father a virtually unanimous, favorable assessment, so Archbishop Henrik Holzer was appointed as special apostolic visitor for the shrine in Medjugorje. In mid-July, just six months ago, with great fanfare and rejoicing, he officially took up residence. That places a papal umbrella over this shrine. Pilgrims arrive in the millions from more than 80 different countries. Archbishop Hoser is there to welcome them in the name of the Vatican. Medjugorje, in the Diocese of Mostar, is the only city in the world which has two bishops who are equally mentioned in the canon of the Mass. The messages 
probably won't be approved until our ladies' appearances have reached their conclusion. But in the meantime, we are being encouraged by the church to venerate Mary in this place, attend the masses which are offered in many languages, and approach the sacrament of forgiveness in the many confessionals, which in the summer months are filled with a large number of priests. I gave you an overview of the best websites because I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Others have told the story of the apparitions. So if Medjugorje is new to you, please consult those sources. What I offer at Marian News is the mosaic perspective. What special piece does Medjugorje provide among Mary's apparitions to the modern world? The phenomenon of Medjugorje is enormous. If we consider only its duration and the return to the faith of countless pilgrims, the main miracle, it could be argued, is that Mary could deliver the same brief, basic message of prayer and conversion without exactly repeating herself. These visionaries would have to be geniuses to compose several thousand messages so similar in content, but always different. The Medjugorje was never among my personal priorities in Marian apparitions. The ten secrets were quite secret. The rather benign public conversion messages didn't have the depth of mystery to grab my attention, as for example Amsterdam, Marian Fried, or Akita. Lynn had mentioned his Christmas grace to me. If he said something about inviting me to join the pilgrimage, I didn't take it seriously. The idea seemed vague in his mind and totally surreal in my mind. That kind of trip was not in my budget, but I had not yet come to know Lynn. When he gets an inspiration in prayer, there is no going back. He had planned from the beginning to pay my way. If he had seemed initially uncertain, it was only that he wasn't sure how many pilgrims could join us and whether he could find a package tour or if he needed to hire a private tour guide. Sometime in January, he explained that in prayer, it was clear to him that we had to be there on the Feast of Mary's Annunciation. He told me to block out that week on my calendar. Alas, I had just committed our Kia tokens to hosting a day of recollection every Saturday in Lent. Our apostolate was just getting off the ground. This was more important to me right now than Medjugorje. But there is a saying that nobody goes to Medjugorje unless they are called. I had not sought to go there. Obviously, I was being called. And it was very exciting to think that I would be there on the most important feast of the order, the day when Mary became the mother of God. Melanie said that the sisters received the habit on that feast. At that time, in January, two women were helping me work out the details of the habit which Melanie had seen in vision. Was it a sign that Mary would obtain a bishop to begin the order soon? To my immense delight, Len wanted reparation to the Holy Face to be the center of our pilgrimage, our prayers together, and our time away from our busy schedules, the challenges of a long journey with passports and several flight changes, every sacrifice, great or small, would be offered in atonement for the sins and scandals of the clerical sex abuse and for conversion and healing of the church. Lynn invited about 40 persons, and I invited even more. But two months wasn't enough notice for most working people who have to schedule vacation time. We ended up with 14 persons from seven states. All but one of us knew Lynn, but few of us knew each other. All believed in Medjugorje. None of us were looking for signs and wonders. None of us felt a need for the testimony of the seers. We all just wanted to pray. Pray, pray. Spending time with these wonderful Catholics was the first and greatest grace of my pilgrimage. We flew into Mostar, then took a two-hour bus ride. My first impression was the barrenness of this place. The country was made up of rocks and clay. I saw no cattle and only a few scrawny goats. If beasts could hardly survive, how did this land support human beings? <laughs> When I got off the bus, it was worse, more rocks than soil. It was early spring. Summer foliage might help eventually to hide the barrenness. Even the fruit trees, though, which were in blossom, were rather pathetic and scrawny. The photographer, who Len hired, didn't even take close-up pictures of the vineyards because they were too ugly to look at. 
just bare trunks then and clay dirt. I'm sure in the summer the landscape has some charm, but arable land and rich soil is obviously scarce. The hardest working farmer could never get rich. In fact, in the 1930s, crop failure and famine were lurking at the door. Pope Pius XI offered a special indulgence and urged parishes to build a cross to commemorate the holy year of 1933. The pastor obtained a relic of the true cross and the villagers set to work. Almost 50 years later, Italian pilgrims heard about the apparitions of Mary on the hill. They saw the cross and headed for the wrong hill. This mountain became the scene of many solar miracles and also some Marian apparitions. Thanks to Father Slavko, it forms a routine part of the pilgrim itinerary. I was spared the arduous climb because someone sought me out that morning for some spiritual direction. Father Slavko climbed the mountain every morning, and in the afternoon he climbed Apparition Hill to lead pilgrims in prayer. During the night, his typewriter was busy pecking out books and prayer books to spread Mary's messages. Father's zeal was multifaceted. He prayed and fasted for guidance on how to help the war orphans. A man from Austria purchased land, but it was impossibly rocky. Father prevailed on the peacekeeping French military to use their men and equipment to bulldoze the rocks and level the area to build housing, which still today serves many persons in distress. Father Slavko had mastered several languages. Then Koreans began arriving, and he wanted to make them feel welcome, so he was learning Korean when the Lord took him to his reward. This Franciscan died in the year 2000, but in 2019, he was still very much alive in the veneration of the people. An Irish pilgrim eagerly offered to lead me to the priest's grave. Father really inspired me. Father Slavko, pray for us and obtain for us your apostolic energy. I had read, and many people told me, that they experienced such a wonderful sense of peace when they came to Medjugorje that they want to return again and again. I wasn't feeling this way. The church was ugly. The countryside was ugly. The buildings were ugly, as one would expect in an ex-communist country. The roads were poor, and the people were poor. And you couldn't walk anywhere without running into villagers trying to sell handmade items for embarrassingly low prices. Why didn't I feel the same sense of wanting to stay here forever? I began to ask random English-speaking pilgrims why they loved Medjugorje and why they returned. Some had even rented apartments to remain for weeks and months at a time. I received a more satisfactory explanation. Because, they said, I go into church and people are praying, really praying. The church is always full. I don't experience that at home. I don't feel like I have others to pray with back home. The church, full church, was an understatement. The evening devotions were from 5 to 8 p.m., and some nights there was adoration, so people remained into the night. I went into the church the first two evenings, and after that, I preferred to sit outdoors in the cold and watch Mass on the big screen rather than be crammed and jammed. The first night, we couldn't even find standing room in the aisles. We stood in the vestibule where we couldn't see anything. People came very early to get a seat. Many came every night, week after week, year after year. No one was offering them any incentives, far from it. I began to reflect on what these good people were telling me. As a religious, I attended daily mass, chanted the divine office seven times a day, and prayed the rosary with people who wanted to pray. Religious don't normally pray alone or in an empty church. I didn't have to travel halfway across the world to find people to pray with. I was spoiled. My cup was flowing over. These lay people had no wine. Their dioceses were dry. Liturgies were banal and minimal. This barren, ugly village of Medjugorje was for them an oasis in a spiritually barren and ugly world. However, my friends in the vibrant Wichita Diocese, which has an adoration chapel in nearly every parish, manned 24-7, 365 by the laity, told me that they kept returning to Medjugorje because Mary keeps returning there. Well, I couldn't argue with that. 
It's right to honor the queen's appearance and go there. Before I leave the subject of the ugliness of this church, I have to say it really did disturb me. The church was clean and cared for, unlike many of the beautiful churches I saw in France. But I couldn't understand how millions of pilgrims couldn't have enriched this place of worship to make it more worthy of God. At the final Q&A session with Muriana, I asked if there were any plans to decorate the apse. She lit up and said that Archbishop Hoser had a long list of plans, and if he only accomplishes half of them, it will be marvelous. In that sentence, I recognized the pain of the villagers. The ugly church was not their desire. Renovations have been inhibited for years by a communist government, and then undoubtedly by church authorities who were of an iconoclast mindset, enough said. I had read blogs that the village is totally different than in the early days of the apparition, that it's been greatly enlarged and has many shops. Well, it happened to Lourdes and then to Fatima. Pilgrims always want to buy devotional objects and souvenirs. Somebody's going to make a profit. But the shops I entered were very humble. The guide who welcomed us at the airport was a native of Mejigorje. As we drove toward the village, he boasted that Mejigorje is the Beverly Hills of the peninsula. What? All the buildings look like boxes. <laughs> look closely at this photo. You are looking at the front of the buildings. I walked past them for several days before I realized I was walking in the street and not a back alley. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Beverly Hills in the Republic of Herzegovina. Mejuori is not a Ponzi scheme to make money. This photo gives us an idea of the village as it must have been in the early days when most homes were made of rocks, a tile roof, and clay for mortar. After enough weather, the clay washes away and the whole edifice starts to collapse. These buildings have to be replaced every number of years. Naturally, when homes began to collapse and there was money coming in from visitors, families built sturdier houses and added a story or two as a pension to give accommodation to the ever-increasing number of pilgrims. Just because some of the visionaries also operate a pension to serve the pilgrims, I assure you, they are not getting rich. Miryana was one of the cooks at our pension. Most of the action at Mejigori <laughs> takes place here on Apparition Hill. Our Lady appeared many times on this hill. A rusty cross was erected to mark the place where Ivan would come to pray. The villagers wanted to paint it, but paint was very hard to get in those days when it was a communist regime. Finally, someone had a permit to paint a porch and had a little leftover to donate, and the color just happened to be blue. Lynn had imprudently invited my friend Pam to join us on the pilgrimage. He was evidently unaware of her litany of serious health problems and equally unaware of her devotion to Mary. She made many calls to line up oxygen and a wheelchair for all the stages of her airline flight and at the pension we would stay at. Who would carry her oxygen and help her? I drove to Kansas City to fly out with her as her personal companion leaving my van with her husband. I was looking forward to the day when I would climb Apparition Hill, making the Stations of the Cross. Mickey would lead us. We were set up with radios so we could hear if we become separated. We pushed Pam several blocks and parked her here at the bottom of this hill where she could listen to us. I was placing one foot in front of the other, anxious not to break an ankle. When I looked back to see Pam, with her severe curvature of the spine, leaning on her cane and climbing the rocks. I was so annoyed. She was being insane. We were doing all we could to climb the hill ourselves. If she fell, how could we carry her down? I was so angry that I didn't offer to carry her backpack. I put myself some distance from her and tried to stifle my emotions. When at last we made it to the third station, it dawned on our group all at once, almost collectively, the pan was with us. This was impossible. It was a miracle. I ran to grab her red bag. The rest of the climb was a very exciting, precisely because Pam was with us. Pam was utterly unprepared for the surprise at the top of the hill. 
a large statue of Mary with Korean engravings. Mickey explained that this was a gift from Korean pilgrims. How did they get it up here? Did they drop it with a helicopter? Pam began to weep tears of joy. Unable to bear children, she and her husband had adopted two children from Korea. Pam never used her wheelchair during the rest of the trip. Our Lady, though, didn't straighten out her back. There was no permanent healing. Pam would return home, content to offer her prayers and sufferings in reparation to the holy face of Jesus for the sins of the clergy. Our Lady's initial apparitions were on the edge of the path, which is now a paved street and a bus stop. But after the third apparition ended, it was about seven in the evening. The children were starting home through a crowd of onlookers when Maria felt herself mysteriously pushed to the side of the trail. She alone saw the Virgin here. Our Lady was crying, and there was a bare wooden cross behind her. Maria said the Virgin was very sad. It was an overwhelming experience, said Maria. I saw the Madonna weeping, and the sight drove me to commit myself totally to her request. She had come to inspire all of us to search for peace, peace in our hearts, peace within our families, peace in the world. I have a YouTube clip, the very end of it, it's Mariana talking about how Mary always appears, always serious, never laughing, not crying, but very serious and even sad when she talks about sinners. Okay, last one. Excuse me, you said she's beautiful and joyful. Does she laugh and joke at all? <laughs> no, she's not Italian. <laughs> Now, Lady is not. Uh, she's not joking, right? If she speaks about Jesus, she's smiling. But it's only a smile. And if she speaks about us, she's always sad. There are no joking or, or laughing with her, no. Smile or sorry. What I see the most on her face is uh, determination or decisiveness. Like when we mothers decide, I will help my child. Whether my child wants it or not, but I will help my child. That is the way I interpret Our Lady's expression on her face. And the pain on her face, that is very painful. Because I saw on earth women who suffer. You can see suffering on the face of those women. But suffering on Our Lady's face, every muscle on her face is talking about the suffering. When she's talking about unbelievers. And that really breaks your heart. Because she knows what will happen with those children if they do not listen. And as a mother, she's suffering. But this suffering is very painful to look at. At La Salette, Mary wept during the entire apparition. The children said the tears fell without interruption. From what I understood, at Medjugorje, Mary wept only once, and it was the third day. Why was she weeping so early and before the girl Maria, who bore her name? In Exodus 19, God told Moses to prepare the people for the third day. God came down from the mountain with the miraculous signs, and the people proclaimed that they would do whatever the Lord tells them. But soon, they sinned with the golden calf. In the Gospel of John, on the third day, Mary asked Jesus to perform his first sign, changing water to wine. And she told the servants to do whatever the Lord tells them. But soon his own people, including the sovereign pontiff Caiaphas, called for his death. At Medjugorje, millions of people have witnessed miraculous signs. But at the beginning, already on the third day, Mary was hinting that conversion would not be sufficiently deep and lasting 
to spare the world from judgment. Soon, she proceeds to deliver ten secrets, which all concern chastisement. One is a sign rather than a chastisement, but she said that the sign would be too late for many. Where else do we hear about ten chastisements? Yes, the ten plagues in Exodus. And where does Jesus talk about the Exodus? At his transfiguration. St. Luke said he spoke with Moses about his coming Exodus. Jesus would be the sacrificed lamb crossing over to blaze the way to an eternal promised land. And where next in the Bible do we hear of the number 10 and plagues and chastisements? Yes, the book of the Apocalypse. St. John foresaw that at some future time, the church would be one with the slain lamb, persecuted, harassed, with many martyrs, and this would blaze the trail to a new earth which would be transformed into a promised land in which God is loved and obeyed. Mejigorje is a sign of coming apocalyptic chastisements. And Mejigorje is a sign of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And a new Pentecost day in which millions of people in different languages confess their sin of having failed to recognize the Messiah in their daily lives. The children were young when Mary said the secrets would unfold in their lifetimes. Now the visionaries have children of their own. Len told me to prepare some talks because in Mejigorje I could take advantage of the videographer that he was hiring. How strange. I knew that the public appearance of the Antichrist was imminent. Ten years previously in the cloister, I had received clear insights on the prophecy of Daniel which indicated the year to expect the Antichrist. But I have hesitated to share that knowledge because many think it means the end of the world. As I prepared the talk, I was going over my notes and came across the stigmatist father's Lotko Shudok. With a bit of internet research, I discovered he was leading a pilgrimage that would overlap a day with our pilgrimage. Would I see him? Would I learn anything about him? I made some inquiries in the village. He was held to be a devout priest, but what was I to think about a diocesan priest who insists on dressing in white like a future pope? And what was I to think about a musician priest who lets himself be depicted as walking on water and in the company of a scantily clad woman? Evidently, Zlatko Shudok is not the Antichrist. At Mejigorje, twice during the pilgrimage and once immediately afterward, Three separate people told me to expect a man who would be from the Middle East, possibly a Muslim, and possibly a world leader of the European Union or the United Nations. I was told that both coasts of the United States would be severely chastised. The implication was weather, but more could be involved. I was told that the center swath from Canada to Mexico would bear the burden of the wrath of the Antichrist in our nation because this is where we would find the most Christians. I was told that the earthquake in the Indian Ocean that caused the tsunami of 2004 tilted the earth enough to begin very gradually moving the direction of the poles and this will disrupt agricultural production. Even this past winter, thousands of cattle perished in the central Midwest because farmers had no shelters built because they never heard of such low temperatures. At the same time, the cold temperatures caused a massive fruit crop failure in the southeastern United States. And the melting snow flooded millions of acres of grain fields. I was told that the weather is going to get worse. One of the witnesses to the imminent appearance of the Antichrist was only indirectly present at Mejigorji. At the daily English Mass, I noted the presence of pilgrims from Ireland. In the USA, Christina Gallagher is a controversial figure. On the one hand, not one of her prophecies has failed to come true. But lately, she had closed the House of Prayer in Kansas in an abrupt manner that did not seem Christian. What do the Irish think of their countrywoman? Again and again, I was met with silence and a curt, you don't need Christina. But then one gentleman pulled me away and we spent several hours over the next couple of days. He told me many things that explained her behavior and assured me that she will be vindicated and I can be confident that she is a genuine prophetess. I'll do a YouTube on her as soon as I can do that.
The imminence of the end times kept rising in my heart during my stay in Medjugorje. The videographer found a 90 minute slot to record my talk and now I have the courage to give it. Most of our group stayed to listen. Brian, my long-term YouTube fan, affirmed that it was the driest talk I had ever given, totally different in style. But he couldn't think of another way for me to present the material since it was necessary to take the Bible and discuss passage after passage in Daniel, verse by verse. So there I was in Medjugorje, standing before a camera in a pension built over the exact spot where Mary had appeared many times, and I was talking about the imminent appearance of the Antichrist. I was told to stand in a spot where the lighting was good. I looked up to see a picture of Pope St. John Paul smiling down at me. But when I viewed the video later, the good Pope was not visible from the wall. Instead, behind me was the picture of two disturbing prelates, Bergoglio and Schoenborn. I'll leave it at that. Thenceforth, our group seemed to bond ever closer. We were more diligent to set aside time together each day for prayers of reparation to the holy face. I saw other signs of the end times of Medjugorje. One, the scourge of Islam and the scourge of socialism, the scourge of a fratricidal war and the scourge of poverty. Mickey was anxious for us to know about the political history of the place. Slavs arrived in the seventh century as pagans by the 8th century, they were fervent Christians. In the 9th century, the Croatian king, Bronimir, Mur means peace and was a typical of royal names, assigned a document promising never to attack a neighbor or disrespect his boundaries and never to separate from the pope. The Ottomans arrived in the 15th century and ruled into the 19th century. These Muslims destroyed all crosses and churches. It became dangerous to openly profess faith in Christ. Some Catholics converted to avoid trouble. He didn't get into politics, but he wanted us to know that Russia will always side with the Serbs. So Medjugorje knows the heavy hand of Islam by long experience. Secondly, Miki wanted us to know that we in the West must understand that socialism is always anti-God and basically no different from communism. After World War II, Tito ruled over the six republics of Socialist Federation of Yugoslavia. In his first two months, between May and June of 1945, 600 priests were killed. By eliminating the shepherds, the socialists felt they could more easily manipulate the people. Thirdly, he wanted us to see for ourselves that socialism always leads to poverty. Our Lady told Father Gobi that the Catholics of the United States would have their wealth reduced in atonement for their sins. Let's get used to it and accept the punishment gracefully. Fourthly, and many others have pointed this out, Mary has said that Medjugorje and Rwanda are signs for the whole world. These were Christian or Catholic people killing other people because of long-standing pride and unforgiveness. Mary said we must pray deeply, forgive deeply, to have the gift of peace. Otherwise, a brutal, unimaginable war is ahead of us on a global scale. Miryana gave me a hint of how the Catholics around Medjugorje, after 10 years of Mary's apparitions, could still be caught up in such a horrible war. I asked her to give us some advice on how to evangelize the Muslims. She said that the Muslims in her area weren't militant about their religion. They didn't wear the burqa, the dress like everybody else. They ate pork. On holidays, her Muslim friends came to her house and she went to their house and they partook of each other's cultural traditions. In other words, religion was not a life for the Catholics, the Orthodox or the Muslims, but just a custom. God will not protect that. And I would like to make another observation, referring to what I said about Medjugorje being a sign of the New Jerusalem. The Church of St. James is now iconic. It's the only Catholic church of the village. In fact, it serves five villages. Many of Mary's apparitions took place in one of the towers of the church. Archbishop Hoser will set about beautifying it. But I want to point out that it was built after the Vatican Council. The altar was never against the wall, 
The church never knew the Tridentine Latin liturgy. And I think this is a sign that the true spirit of the council will eventually prevail. I plan to do a separate YouTube on the Latin rite and why it was right for it to be updated. Another devotion took hold of our group from two directions, namely the flame of love from the approved revelations of Mary to Elizabeth Kindleman. A Canadian in our group was a national director, and on our closing night, a United States Flame of Love convention arrived for their stay in Mejimurji, and it was arranged that several of their leaders would join us during our farewell dinner. One of them sat down next to me and proceeded to speak of the end times. It was yet another verification that Mary is preparing us to get ready. The pilgrimage was over. At 2 a.m. we had to rise and depart in the dark. We said our goodbyes at Mostar as we would be taking different flights back to America. Lynn, standing there, promised to arrange a weekly teleconference so that we could continue praying together in reparation to the Holy Face. Pam and I, she's in the very back of that row sitting down there, would be together all our way to Kansas City. She was treated badly on two European airlines. One even denied her oxygen for one short flight, but she was filled with peace. Already, the lambs were beginning to be sacrificed. Brian, with the arrow there, collapsed at the airport in Munich. He lingered in a coma, and then God called him home on Easter Wednesday. This was a personal blow for me, since he had become a dear friend. Brian, like my father, was a Protestant convert. Brian, like me, had many Protestant relatives and friends. Brian, like me, loved them and prayed with them. Brian, like me, was excited about everything. He was an experienced editor and kept insisting that I delay no longer about collecting my apparition transcripts and publish them in a book. He offered to edit the talks to make them flow as chapters. And now he was gone but he was interceding for me. During the flight, I typed my handwritten notes into my laptop and reflected that Brian was the only person in the group to have seen a solar miracle during our stay. Pam's miracle was beautiful, but temporary. What grace was I coming back with from my journey? New friends. Mary had told Father Gobi that she would connect her people when the times arrived. We arrived in Kansas City at midnight. In the morning, Pam's husband drove us to Mass, where they ran into friends. We ended up going to breakfast with people who told me of a visionary in Missouri. I got into my 1999 van and got on the highway. I would take a route to Wichita that would let me visit my uncle in southwest Missouri. I stopped for gas. When I turned on the ignition light, a full panel of warning lights went on. My uncle is a mechanic. He put the van on his four-post lift, and the diagnosis was dire. The next day, I took it to my Wichita mechanic, and he said the van was beyond repair. I could drive it short distances, but it was leaking three kinds of fluid. A great calm descended on me. I was not supposed to try to figure out how to get a vehicle. Mary would take care of it. Within 72 hours, my brother-in-law handed me the keys to this 2006 Kia. He and my sister had been talking together about rotating out their oldest family caller, and they decided to do it that weekend. I regard this as my first post Mejigori miracle. <laughs> Another would follow. I needed a bishop and was looking toward the Bishop of Salina. He is a man of prayer, devoted to Mary. He mounted a statue of Mary in the crook of his staff when he was consecrated last summer. A man in my parish died, and his son was a priest in the Diocese of Salina. The pastor announced that the Bishop of Salina was coming to preside at the funeral, and everyone was invited. The pastor said he would try to find a few minutes to speak of the order to the bishop on my behalf. The coffin, after the funeral, was carried in the rain to the cemetery adjacent to the church. We stood with our umbrellas around the tent. After the service, everyone dispersed. The bishop emerged from the tent without an umbrella. I was the only one nearby. So there we were, conversing about the order under my umbrella. I am giving this conference in the Midwest and telling the listeners that the central swath of the United States will be ground zero for persecution from the Antichrist. 
Look at this weather map. It shows the central swath as the windiest part of the nation. In Medjugorje, Mary had a word to say about that. February 15, 1984. The wind is my sign. When the wind blows, know that I am with you. You have learned that the cross represents Christ. It is a sign of him. I am with you in the wind. Do not be afraid. Why the wind? She is the spouse of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. Let us blow wherever the Spirit sends us. Thank you for listening to my reflections of Medjugorje, and I hope you were inspired to read her messages and perhaps even to go there. God bless you.